said I'm not a neo-Latinist, so the past few days have been very interesting for me, um, especially because I think what they showed is how much overlap there really is in research questions and sort of topics between various research communities, and so also the value in, in, in sharing and, and linking our data. So what this talk is, is in a way also an invitation to come and have a look at the data that Cyril has and um, sort of see whether you can make use of it for your own research. So I'm just going to share my screen now so you can also see the slides here. Just give me a second, please. You should be able to see the slides now and I cannot see you anymore. Um, so let's just get started. Um, so CERL is the Consortium of European Research Libraries uh, and uh, I work for the uh, State and University Library in Göttingen where we um, act as the main digital infrastructure provider for CERL um, under the name of Data Conversion Group. Um, CERL itself is a network of currently 292 research libraries um, but beyond this sort of institutional membership, it's also a wider community of um, librarians, archivists, and, and scholars, mostly from the field of uh, book history. And the aim of the consortium is to um, share resources and expertise um, with sort of broader aim of improving access to the European printed heritage. So the focus of activity of the consortium is um, printing between roughly 1450 and 1830, so um, sort of early modern printing, pre-industrial. Um, the consortium itself was founded in 1992, so it's really a long-term project. It's been running for about 30 years now, um, and it has expanded its activities over the time. So um, it does a lot of sort of community work, like summer schools and internships and stuff like that. But what it also does and has been doing since the 90s is we maintain and develop um, a range of databases. And those range from a sort of classical library catalogs to um, specialized research projects and, and their data. And so this is what I'm going to focus on today, the data that we have and, and how it might connect to research on um, Neo-Latin studies. So what types of data do we have? Um, I'd roughly partition it into three types of data, um, bibliographic provenance and authority data. So um, bibliographic data, what I mean by that is sort of data on the level of the editions, so the sort of print runs of books. And that is what is most comparable sort of classical library catalog data. So you've got things like uh, who's the author of that, what's the title, when has this been printed, where has it been printed, sort of um, that kind of information. And we have two major databases with bibliographic information um, in our sort of set of databases. The first one is the Heritage of the Printed Book Database. Um, the HPB, which is an aggregated catalog with about 8 million records. Um, and then slightly more focused is the ISTC and the International Short um, Title Catalog, which, it, um, which is um, focused on Incunabula, so everything printed roughly before 1500, has about 30,000 records, and that's actually the British Libraries catalog that we at CERL host for them. Um, the second level of data that we have is what I call provenance data. It's essentially copy specific data. So whereas the other, uh, the bibliographic level sort of describes entire print runs, um, this is really about the book as a physical artifact. And so what it collect, collects is both a physical description, for example, on the binding, any damages to this particular copy, decorations that are in there and so on and so forth. And also, and this is a major part of our databases, provenance evidence. So any kind of material trace that book ownership has left in the book. So we have inscriptions by previous owners, ex libris stamps, and so on and so forth. Um, and also documentary evidence on, on um, the way that books have been traded, owned, and so on and so forth. Um, our major database there is material evidence in Incunabula. Again, um, that focuses on Incunabula, has about 50,000 records. And then we also have various smaller databases for particular research projects on particular topics. I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. And the third category of data that we have is um, sort of 
standard authority data. And I think this nicely connects uh, back to one of the remarks in the last discussion, um, because what we do there is we collect data on agents and places. So um, authors, booksellers, printers, publishers, as they relate to printing in that time period. And what we try to get there is um, all kinds of data on them. So this is sort of our data hub for linking all the other things together. So what we collect there is, for example, variant names, which is very important for the time period, things like variant spellings, but also Latinized name forms, for example. Um, we collect biographical information um, or just general information on, on corporations as well, um, dates of existence and stuff like that. Um, and then we also try to make this really as linked as possible to other authority sources and um, entities within our own database. So what we do is we will link to relevant entities. For example, if we have a person, we try to link to their place of birth in our own database, their parents, business partners, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we also try to link to that same entity in other authority files and sources. So for example, the German Gemeinsame Normdatei, Viaf, um, Wikidata, and so on and so forth. Um, so the aim is that if you have the CT identifier, that's the, the database, the sort of thesaurus, um, that you can also take that and go to all the other databases that might have additional information on this. So as I just said, the CT is our major database there with about one and a half million records. And then we have very smaller databases, mostly from, again, specialized research projects on particular sets of authority data. Um, to give you an overview, which you don't have to memorize, um, but just to sort of show you what um, kinds of databases we have in there, um, I've sort of highlighted the three levels of um, uh, of data we have. Um, and so you can see here that we have our two major bibliographic databases. Um, in dark blue, and then we have material evidence in Incunabula, which is um, linked to the ISTC because it basically annotates ISTC records with additional copy specific information. And then we have our smaller databases which do the same thing for post Incunabula, and so they annotate more generic records from the heritage of the printed book database. This is in turn linked to the source thesaurus, and so you can see how these all, in a way, go together. Of course, there's a lot of stuff that could still be done there, but um, it's a sort of growing ecosystem of, of data. Um, and we continue to add to it. So for example, this database here, the Mainz Academica Bibliotheken has just been launched um, two days ago. Um, so you might be wondering why I'm presenting this at a conference on Neo-Latin, but you're probably already aware that the history um, of early modern printing culture and Latin are tightly connected. Uh, so this is um, uh, statistics that about 70% of Incunabula were actually printed in Latin. And so a lot of the material that we have actually relates to books printed in Latin, authors writing in Latin, booksellers selling Latin books and so on and so forth. So the pie chart that you can see here is from the ISTC again, where you can see that roughly those 70% are um, in, in, in the purple area, which is Latin, and then the other languages have much smaller sections. Um, in absolute numbers, currently we have uh, 21,337 editions in the ISTC that are in Latin. Um, that's a clickable link, so you can immediately go to all of them. Um, and for roughly 12,000 of these 21,000 editions, we also have detailed copy specific descriptions in MEI. And so because for one edition, there can be multiple copies, there's about 47,000 extant copies of Latin books described in MEI at the moment. Um, the Sir Thesaurus also has biographical information on Neo-Latin authors. Um, and the beautiful thing about a database like this is there's probably a lot more in there that might be interesting for your particular research questions that is open to discovery. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use our systems to make those discoveries. Um, all our databases are open and freely available, and it's essentially two ways of accessing them. Um, we have a web interface uh, that you can use for searching and displaying records, and the editors of the databases also use that for editing the records. 
Um, but if you come from a more sort of computationally oriented uh, research tradition, we also have API based machine readable access. Now, because this is sort of an introduction to the databases, I will focus on the web interface. Um, but you can see a comparison between the two ways of accessing the data in a um, info session called reusing soil data that we recorded and also put up on YouTube. So there's a link here as well, where I compare the two um, a little bit more closely and also talk about um, some other linked open data activities. Um, we've also recently published a Python library um, for accessing this API in an even more comfortable way. It's um, that's something I'm very happy to be presenting here as well, um, because it's fairly new. I think we've published it in February, so um, it's, it's fairly recent. Um, I'm going to um, show you the web interface sort of sorted by those three categories of data as well. So I'm going to start with the bibliographic data, the editions. Um, our largest database there, as I said, is the Heritage of the Printed Book Database, the HPB. It's in a way also our legacy database in that it is the original database that the consortium was founded to sort of support and host. And it's a traditional union catalog with aggregated information on roughly 8 million prints from our area of uh, time span of interest. Um, and so what we do there is we basically collect um, entries from library catalogs all across Europe and, and North America from our member libraries and other suppliers. And then we bring them all together in one enormous database, um, but without doing much work on the records themselves. So it's, it's sort of really just an aggregation of um, the entries from other catalogs. Um, for this reason, because it, it is sort of an older project, it also has a different interface from all other databases. It's a traditional library OPEC. So if you've ever done any library research, which you probably have, um, you are probably familiar with what it looks like. I'm going to show you in a second. It's very useful for finding records across Europe and identifying institutions that hold editions that might be of interest to you. Um, but as I said, we don't do much sort of data normalization on it. It's, it's just sort of standard library data in the respective cataloging traditions from wherever the data comes from. So this is what it looks like. Um, and if you're particularly searching for Latin materials in there, the best way to do that is to use our advanced search feature, which you can see here under the number one. Um, and if you open that, you'll be presented with a screen like that. And there you can simply set the language to Latin and then set all the other parameters you're interested in. And you will automatically only get back search results for books that have been printed in Latin. Um, what you get once you've sort of looked for something is, is catalog entries like this. And as I said, this is sort of a standard library interface. I can see here, this is for example, a title by Isaac Newton. Um, it lists the language as Latin, this is why we found it. And then, for example, down there, you can see which libraries actually hold a copy of this book. So this is good as a sort of initial uh, way of, of, of finding copies of titles and, and, and sort of taking it from there. Um, and you get all the other sort of cataloging data, depending on the cataloging level of the uh, library. Um, the Incunabula Short Title Catalog, the ICC, is um, a database that's much more focused, and so it's also a lot smaller, and there's a lot of uh, sort of more tight editorial control over it, so it's uh, created and maintained by the British Library, and we host it for them, um, and it's essentially an international database of 15th century European printing. It has those 30,000 records, which in turn, again, list about um, 450,000 copies, um, and of those 30,000, as I said before, 21,000 are in Latin. And so you can also search for just the Latin ones in the um, database uh, with the search string here, which is also linked. Um, and what you get here, this is sort of our standard interface for all the other databases that are not the HPB. Um, this is kind of results interface. Um, where you can sort of see all the um, incunabula that have been recorded internationally. Um, you can limit it further by things like the format of the book or the holding country. And then if you select a title from the list of Latin items, you'll be presented with further information on the edition. So things like the author, the title, but um, also very interesting things like um, reference works that describe this edition. 
Um, we try to also get, um, and this is probably especially interesting if you're interested in the contents of the books, we also try to collect um, digitizations here. Um, you can see here there's also some microfiche still, but also the um, digital copies that are linked uh, from various institutions. So this is quite good if you want to sort of compare things or um, if you're looking for something you can OCR, um, you can sort of go through them and see which one's best. Uh, you can see here the holding institutions as well, if you want to have a look at the actual um, book in, in its physical uh, form. And then, um, as you can see here, this is also linked to our other database, MEI, um, where if we have a copy specific description of one of the copies that are listed here, we can also go straight to MEI and see the more detailed description on that, which we're also going to do now in the presentation. So um, when we come to provenance data and copy specific information, um, as I said, the, the sort of main database there is material evidence in, in Cunebula from the 15th century book trade project in Oxford. And what it does is essentially it collects provenance information for copies of editions in ICC. So it in a way annotates ICC records further. Um, it's a very large collaborative project. So there's over 150 editors worldwide where people actually go into libraries and sit down and catalog the books and trace all these previous owners. And then in a lot of uh, painstaking manual labor, um, put that into our database. So it's a, it's a very sort of large um, collaborative research effort. It currently has uh, over 15,000 editions in 56,000 copies from um, 450 holding institutions. And again, as I said before, 46,000 of these copies are in Latin. You can also search for them essentially because they are linked to the respective ICC record, which also lists the language. Uh, what it also collects here, and I think this is also interesting in sort of seeing who's owned these books over time, is there are 21,000 former and current owners of Incunabula collected here in the respective catalog entries. Um, this is a, a map of where the Incunabula described in the database are currently held. So you can see this is really, um, there's a lot of focus on uh, North America and Europe, of course. Um, this is an interactive map, so you can also, um, it's linked here as well, so you can also use that as a sort of entry point if you want to see what um, libraries close to you have um, and what we have described in our database. And if you actually search in the database, you get this familiar view, which you've already seen for ICC, where again, you can sort of see the uh, titles, you can filter them by things like author, century, holding institution. And then the information that you see in the database is slightly different from what we had in, um, in ICC, because now we really go down to the copy level. And so you get a physical description, but most importantly, you get this detailed provenance history where essentially for every owner of the book, we have a single block of information that tells you who the owner was, um, where this uh, book was held, the time period for which it was held, and then all the sort of information about the physical traces that this owner has left in the book. So things like, um, have they made any comments in the margins? Have they left their sleepers to stamp in their um, damages to the book, stuff like that. Um, and so this really gives you a sort of a uh, good way of, of tracking the life story of a particular copy of a book. Um, there's this second database that sort of comes with MEI, which I just mentioned, um, where each of the owners has its own entry, um, where again, you can sort of see their various activities. So if they've sort of, for example, changed places, that's recorded here as well. And then you can also use that to reconstruct dispersed collections because um, Basically what happens is for each owner, you can get a list of all the copies they have owned that we describe in MEI. And so even if those copies are not held in the same place anymore, you have to sort of virtual reconstruction of that person's library. Um, because MEI focuses only on um, Incunabula, we have um, other databases that sort of extend the scope beyond the post Incunable period, so into the 16th century and beyond. Um, currently, that's um, Patrimonet, which um, collects 16th century Italian popular editions. MathMed Readers is a new research project that focuses on herbals and recipe books, which is, of course, also very interesting. Um, and then our latest edition from two days ago is Mind's Early Modern Academics Libraries, which focuses on books held by um, the um, 
die ähm, Wissenschaftliche Stadtbibliothek in Mainz. Um, so what's happening there is that Searl um, hosts these four research projects. So people, the, the people who have done the research there have uh, sort of gotten in touch with us and said, we have this project. This is the kind of information we record. Um, and so what we do is, is we sort of take, we provide them with the, uh, with the interface where they can create their records um, and display their records. And then we guarantee the long-term long -term availability of the data in our database ecosystem beyond the runtime of the project, which I think is often a problem with uh, a lot of sort of digital humanities projects is that you have funding for three years, um, you create really nice applications, really nice data, funding dries up, the server gets turned off and the data disappears. And so this is something that we're trying to tackle in this way by offering a sort of common infrastructure where research projects can um, deposit their data with us and, and sort of get this live editing environment. But also once they finished working on it, it's still available. It's still linked to all the other information that we have in the databases and we sort of try to preserve it in perpetuity. Um, so if you think you have a project that would fit into our ecosystem, please come and talk to us because uh, of course we're also interested in sort of growing that, um, that network of um, information. The last category of data that sort of is the glue between all of those data sets is the authority data. Um, as I said before, the major data hub that we have there is the Sir Thesaurus that has about one and a half million records of um, persons, corporations, places, and um, printers. Um, the reason why we have a second record type for printers is because in the early modern period, they are kind of a difficult category to grasp. Um, this sort of weird hybrid creature where very often somebody as a person starts printing, then they die and then somebody else continues printing in their name. And so they're not really a person, not really a corporation. And so what we do here is we sort of collect printers separately because they're very important to our research community and then also link them to the respective persons that um, have printed in that name. So very often you'll have a person in the thesaurus twice as a person and as a printer, um, but you can distinguish them by record type. The thesaurus is also aggregated from various sources. Um, so we include both the large national authority files. So for example, the French National Library, the Gemeinsame Normandie, but we also try to get all those small specialized research projects again that are in danger of disappearing or that just have really interesting data um, so it's sort of trying to strike a balance between getting, I don't know how many records from the GND, but then also talking to a small research project that has maybe 50 records, but those are really detailed and interesting. And so we try to get those as well and combine them with the more generic records from the larger authority files in order to build this sort of massive um, data hub on this particular period of time. It's a constant work in progress, so we keep uploading and uploading, updating records. Um, and there's also a lot of manual editing that goes into it. So it's, uh, as you may be aware, it's an area where it's very hard to do something like automated deduplication of records, um, try to distinguish between the, I don't know how many um, Johann Müllers who have printed in German towns and stuff like that. Um, and so we have a small team of manual editors and they have been very, very, um, active, especially in, in the past few months. Um, so I've put this number here just to see um, how much work goes into keeping the data quality in this uh, in this database up. Um, and because I think it's important to make that manual labor visible as well and, and sort of point out how much goes into building these kinds of infrastructures. Um, if you want to have a starting point um, for sort of a neo Latin and sort of source, you can try to search here. Neulat or Neolat, which sort of grabs uh, about 315 people where Neolatin is actually mentioned in their biographies. Um, but beyond that, there's also a field primary language. Um, it's a bit unfortunate because that's not included in the search index, so you can't directly search for it, but I'm going to show you in a minute how you can still get that through the API to find more people with Latin as one of their primary languages in the CT. Uh, which might be interesting if you're trying to build a um, set of, you know, unique identifiers for new Latin authors, that might be a good starting point for, for checking what we already have and, and how that could be brought together. 
So the information that we have in CT records is, as I said, biographical information, both in free text form. So we have um, descriptions of the biographies, but we also try to get standardized things like um, um, life dates, um, places of activity. We have geographical information. So we try to get geo coordinates for all the places that we have and link to. Um, the things we have is variant names, lots of them, because the CT was originally built as a tool for search term expansion in, in the HPB. Um, and so we um, try to collect all the name forms that a person has um, if they appeared in multiple imprint statements and stuff like that. Um, we also try to record relationships with other entities, so relatives, um, business partners, places of activity, whatever we get. And then we also try to link back to the sources for the name and to other databases. Um, to the library catalogs, authority files, Wikidata, of course, is now a central sort of data hub that we also recently updated our links to, and then also some smaller specialist databases. So for example, um, the German Calliope, which collects manuscript materials, we also try to link to that via the GND identifiers. Um, I'm going to show you one of the source records so you can sort of see the various sections in there. Um, so this is, uh, for example, Franciscus Racolangius, and what we have here, it's one of the more extensive records, as you can see here, it's the entire uh, page, um, but it starts with some basic information, so life dates, uh, gender, place of birth, place of death, when has this last been edited, um, you can also see the record here via this link, and then it goes on to uh, links to other records, and those come in various sort of flavors, so we have biographies, we have some sample bibliographic records, for example, of books owned or uh, written by that person, um, we have the related records, which are all the records within the Sirius Thesaurus that link to that or are linked to that. And then the same as section is where we try to sort of connect this to all the other uh, major authority files, DBpedia, Deutsche Nationalbibliothek, Sudok, Biaf, and so on and so forth. Uh, the general note field is where all the text goes into that we can't really sort of um, parse into um, other fields. So this is something that's really made for human consumption mostly. So you can sort of also see that it's multilingual because we get the data from various sources. Um, there's some duplicates in there. So this is something we sort of clean up over time, um, but it's always helpful to sort of see what kind of information there is. Um, then we have the section with more information, which then tries to parse some of the information from the note fields, um, biographical data activities like professions and then some geographic notes on where these people have been active as well. And I think looking at the time, I'm going to go through the rest of it a bit faster. Places of activity, we try to also display that on a map, um, then the related entries with all the other um, entries in the NCT. Variant names, as I said, is a very large section. And then we also list sources. So where has this name been found, which is always important. Um, is this from secondary sources? Is this in the actual printed texts? And so on and so forth. Um, so that's sort of a, a very quick overview of the uh, web interface. Um, as I said, all the records can also be accessed in machine readable form. So we offer various export formats. Um, you can get them as JSON, YAML, RDF. Um, we also have Unimark in the CT um, for backwards compatibility. Um, and there is a, so if you're a standard REST API that you can use for getting that, but I think the easiest way at the moment, if you work with um, Python or have somebody who can work with a little bit of Python, is through our Python library, because what you can do there is essentially just say, um, I have this identifier, give me the record, and that's done in two lines. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Python library, um, because I think it's sort of a comfortable way of accessing our data. So what you can do there is you can search for records in all our databases. Um, you can download them either as sort of native Python dictionaries, which is equivalent to JSON, or in any of the available export formats that we have, like RDF and Unimark. You can access all the data fields beyond what is indexed for search. So this is interesting for the thesaurus especially, which isn't entirely indexed because of its size. Um, we also try to offer shortcuts to common data fields in the records, for example, the CT record type, but this is something that's slightly under construction because I don't quite know what people consider a common data field when they work with our data. Um, 
And then I think one of the nicest things you can do is sort of use that as well in things like Jupyter Notebooks to create reproducible analysis and visualizations based on our data. And this is something I'm going to show you in the next two slides. So what's linked here is a Jupyter Notebook that essentially connects to our database and then for a particular place, in this case Antwerp as an example, it looks for people who have listed Latin as one of the primary languages. And so this is a way of sort of getting to the data that you can't get through the web interface. Um, and so for example, you can see for Antwerp, it immediately gives you 21 records um, of people from Antwerp whose primary language of activity includes Latin, and you can plug in any other place and then it will come back with a list. And so you don't even have to know Python in a way, you just have to plug in a SERL identifier for place into that script and it will run automatically. And I'm happy to share that with you. So what's linked here is just sort of a static HTML version, but I can also give you the notebook proper. The second one is, um, just a quick visualization of data from uh, Alexander Winkler's research project from the next presentation, which he kindly shared with me in advance so I could have a brief look at uh, what neo-Latinists actually do. And so what I did there is um, because uh, what they did in their research project is um, assign GND identifiers to people. Um, I matched them to our SERL identifiers because we also collect the GND identifiers. And then I pulled the places of activity and visualized them on this map. So black is um, places of death, um, green is places of birth, and blue is anything uh, where either people have been born and died or um, other activities like teaching, um, living, and so on and so forth. So this is just a very quick demonstration of the kind of thing you can easily do with this kind of data once it's linked and shared. Um, of course, you'd have to bring your own research questions to it, which is something I can't do as a non-neo-Latinist. Um, as a last note before I finish, um, most of our databases focus on bibliographical and metadata, um, which is simply due to our core community, which is mostly book historians and librarians. But we are also very interested in strengthening our links to representations of the contents of the materials. So I already showed you in ISTC where we collect digitizations as well. So we try to increase the linking to digitized versions. Um, we have a recent project in the pipeline where we also want to link out to TEI transcriptions of the materials. So this is something where we're also interested in talking to people and, and um, seeing what can be done within the scope of our Project. And one thing I want to point out here is um, sort of a sister project that's also um, by the people from the 15th century book trade project in Oxford, which is uh, Text Inc. And it's a 15th century text corpus um, that's hosted at the Bodleian Library, which is tightly linked with ICC and MEI. So basically, um, you can sort of see the um, you can see the metadata in our database and you can see the actual texts in, in text ink um, where they are also further parsed and, and, and uh, annotated. And that is all I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe a very brief note on contacting me because <laughs> while I am still affiliated with Göttingen at the moment, this is actually sadly going to be not the case in two weeks time. So you can reach me still and I'm happy to answer questions um, uh, at my private email address here and you can reach my colleagues in Göttingen who will be continuing to maintain these databases at the address highlighted up here, the convert at gbb.de. And now I'm done, thank you.